I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today we're skydiving through Hyrule as I rank the dungeons of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom from worst to best. As someone who loves the older Zelda titles, I found myself wanting more from the Divine Beasts in Breath of the Wild, and Tears of the Kingdom is definitely a huge step in the right direction. Do I think some of the dungeon designs were hindered by the need for those locations to be accessible and viewable throughout the overworld? Yes, but that doesn't change the fact that for the most part, I had the giddiest little smile on my face as I explored these classic elemental temples and ruins. So let's not waste any time. All six dungeons in The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, ranked and be sure to leave your experiences in the comments below. Bringing up the bottom of our list, we have a dungeon that you can access from the moment you activate your first Sheikah Tower. Floating Hyrule Castle towers above the land, having been raised in the upheaval event that shook the world to its core. And yet the castle isn't technically a dungeon until after you've completed the four regional phenomena quests. I know this because I went to Hyrule Castle early in the game to get the upgraded champion's tunic and found it deserted. There was a shrine to activate and the Dusk Bow at the tip of the castle. It only becomes a dungeon once the story asks you to go there. For Zelda has been spotted and it's up to you to investigate. Unlike the rest of the dungeons in the game, Hyrule Castle isn't focused on puzzles or navigating tough terrain. It's instead a game of hide and seek where apparitions of Zelda appear throughout the castle, and the challenge revolves around fighting hordes of enemies that appear as you approach her. For as interesting a premise as it is, exploring the ruins of the previous game's final dungeon, I can't help but wish they'd done something a little bit different. By the last two enemy encounters, I was already tired of the repetitive format and wondering what the resolution was going to be. Luckily, the boss of the dungeon, a 5v5 battle against Phantom Ganon, helped salvage my thoughts on the actual excursion, though I'll save my thoughts on him as well as the other bosses in Tears of the Kingdom for a future ranking list if that's okay. Hyrule Castle is a glorified enemy gauntlet, and I'm alright with that, truly, but the other five dungeons all had more to offer, and that's just a fact. When I realized that the water temple was going to be situated in the middle of the skies, I groaned audibly, for as much as I enjoy the sky islands in Tears of the Kingdom, situating dungeons in that region can create a lack of space for their designs. And while it was fitting that the wind temple be in the sky, because of course it is, I can't say the same for the water temple. This was my third dungeon I went after, following the Wind and Fire Temples, and I found myself severely disappointed with the lack of navigation challenge. It's five large floating platforms with only four terminals to activate instead of the usual five. It's incredibly easy to make your way to the different platforms, and they felt so sparsely decorated in comparison to the other temples in the game. A few construct enemies, a couple of puzzles to solve out in the open, I don't know, it felt a little lazy to me after coming from a five-floor juggernaut of a temple under Death Mountain. On the plus side, I really enjoyed the actual puzzles once I reached them. Using Ultra Hand on the orb and the floating platforms in the room blocked off by flames was an ingenious solution. Or how about realizing you can move those giant bubbles with Ultra Hand, leading me to use one to conduct electricity to open a gate, and you had to create a water mill to even do that. Activating a floating platform to hold up a large slab to drain the dam was also pretty cool. The only puzzle I actively disliked is the fast spinning switch on the highest platform, as the solution was to slow down time with your bow, which has no real relevance to the water temple as a theme. It just felt like they ran out of ideas on how to create more water puzzles, especially since they pushed themselves into a dead end by situating the temple floating in the sky. Had we gotten a temple in the Zora Waterworks zone, they would have had far more freedom to create a dungeon with a more winding layout to explore. Though we wouldn't have gotten anti-gravity jumping, so in this instance I can forgive and forget. It's by no means a badly designed temple, more so just a forgettable one. The climb up to the temple was more memorable, which is a real shame. 
If you'll allow me to take a few moments of your time, I'm trying to reach 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2023, and I think we can do it. Over 60% of you aren't subscribed, so let's rectify that. Parry that subscribe button for more content every Wednesday. Back to the video. Deep in the depths lies the Construct Factory, which I am considering the dungeon part of the Spirit Temple. As once you create the Minoru Construct, you trounce through the depths to face the boss at the Temple Grounds. And what a leap in quality this was! If you haven't been upgrading or looking into your Zonai equipment, you're gonna be in danger as you try to collect the four robot parts needed to create Minoru's Construct because each of the four depots tests you on your ability to problem solve with the Zonai items. Now, many of my solutions involve attaching rockets and letting the chips fall where they may, but if there was ever a dungeon that showcases how miraculous the physics engine is in Tears of the Kingdom, it's this one. And I understand why some people would rank it as their number one if they are that enamored by the Zonai content. This one door held up by chains had me completely stumped. I've seen the official solution on Twitter now, but my brain was not thinking with physics, so I opened the door and let a Zonai wheel roll under the gap, allowing me to hold it open and slide the constructs I needed underneath. It's this level of problem solving, allowing any solution to work if you can envision it, that makes Tears of the Kingdom so special. Now, if someone could explain to me what the correct solution for this room with the rail is, I would be very appreciative. I couldn't figure it out for the life of me and got disappointed that I had to solve the room with a cheesy method because I sensed the intended strategy would have looked super cool. And that's perhaps my main critique of the Spirit Temple. Due to its location in the depths and also the long journey to the boss, there's a slight sense of disjointedness that you don't get with the other temples in the game. I may have also been hoping it was gonna be the Shadow Temple instead, given this whole questline started in Kakariko Village where the Shadow Temple was in Ocarina of Time. Zonai Tech is so cool and I can't wait to watch more videos on people solving this temple's puzzles. I suspect on future playthroughs, this one will rise in my rankings because it feels like as you understand how Zonai Tech works, you can solve the puzzles here in more ingenious ways. So check back in a year, maybe this will be my number one. <laughs> the first of the four main dungeons I approached, the Wind Temple hidden high atop the Hebra Mountains gave me an absolute rush of excitement when I landed on the bow of the ship for the first time. As I was climbing the Hebra Mountains with Tulin, I kept thinking, is this the temple? I'd read that dungeons made a return, but I assumed when I reached the giant tornado, I'd land in a boss arena. Not a full-scale wind dungeon where you have to use Tulin's ability to fly your way through the various halls of the ship. Now, the actual puzzle design was fairly easy, as it feels like this is intended to be your first dungeon you tackle, but that isn't a complaint on my end. Just the fact that there were locked doors and multiple floors was enough to have me absolutely hyped from start to finish. I do wish the dungeons had a few more area-specific enemies outside of the constructs, but I will take what I can get. Dodging laser cannons while firing bomb arrows to shatter the ice leading to the lower ship, or gliding down through a tube of deadly lasers to land at the bottom and activate a terminal, it filled me with so much joy. Yes, it's the same system used in Breath of the Wild with the Divine Beasts, but we're solving actual puzzles this time. We're exploring fully realized environments and not these mechanical dioramas. Still no idea how you get this chest though, feel free to let me know in the comments. I felt like a genius attaching this ice spike to these cogs, or reversing this giant cog to open a gate I couldn't keep up. And this dungeon is further elevated by doubling up as a boss arena. I have a lot of thoughts on Kolgera as a fight, but I was so lucky it was my first boss because it's grandiose mechanics and that music had me on the edge of my seat. Molgera fans rejoice. It's also worth noting that the barrels scattered around the Wind Temple have a ton of arrows, and they respawn if you warp away and come back. So this location becomes a premium arrow farm in the early game. You're welcome. 
Taking the silver medal today, we have the Fire Temple. And from my brief forays into people's opinions on Twitter, you either love this dungeon or you hate this dungeon. There are no in-between. For me, it was love at first sight. Dropping into the depths and seeing this behemoth of a building in the distance, it puts the Water Temple to shame. But I was most excited when I realized what the main mechanic was. Minecarts! I had really enjoyed the minecart ride up to Death Mountain, as Yonobo's ability to become a living cannonball made for some great level design. And this was further expanded upon here in the Fire Temple. I've always been a fan of switching tracks and riding rails, trying to figure out the right combinations to reach higher into the temple. The first time I shot down another construct on the tracks with Yonobo, I mean, it was perfection. They created a gimmick that lasted for the entire dungeon, and it reminded me so heavily of dungeons like Snowhead Temple from Majora's Mask that utilized the Goron Mask, or the Arbiter's Grounds from Twilight Princess that utilized the Spinner, and I found myself smiling from beginning to end. Now that isn't to say it's a perfect dungeon, I found getting to the last terminal to be confusing, as the higher you got, the less clear the path forward became, and eventually I just started doing what Tears of the Kingdom Link does best, climbing. <laughs> it's a shame that I couldn't figure out what to do for the last terminal, as my brain just didn't register how to use those Zonai items effectively, but by that point I'd already had my fun, I was satisfied. There was one moment in this dungeon that stuck out to me, and that was when I unlocked an elevator between the ground floor and the floor above. Of everything in Tears of the Kingdom, that felt the most like a traditional Zelda dungeon to me. Just a simple shortcut. <laughs> and my love of the Fire Temple only grew when I saw the boss, absolutely losing my mind as Goma, my beloved, made its way back into the mainline Zelda games. It's good to have you back, buddy. And yet there was one more dungeon that exceeded expectations and provided a perfect level of challenge. Just like in Breath of the Wild, the Gerudo got the best dungeons to play with, as topping my list is the Lightning Temple, an ancient pyramid in the depths of the Gerudo Desert. Only accessible after solving a large-scale pillar puzzle, it's the only dungeon that actually takes place on the regular surface of Hyrule, and that gives it an inherent advantage, as you can do whatever you want with a building like that. In the depths or the sky, there are certain constraints you have to adhere to, but not so with the Lightning Temple, as they made it this massive pyramid that could contain whatever they wanted. It has this Indiana Jones vibe as you explore the catacombs below, avoiding traps and disabling them so Riju can pass through before you emerge in the main portion of the temple. And here we get the classic light puzzles making a return. The Gerudo and light puzzles go together like mint and chocolate. It's a combination that will always get my fun meter rising. And in this case, they utilize some pretty fun mechanics. Going from floor to floor, moving mirrors to shift where the light goes, it was so much fun. There always seemed to be a hidden room or two off the beaten path if you went searching, and progression wasn't inherently obvious like in the Wind Temples, nor was it too convoluted that I'd get stuck like in the Fire Temple. It was a perfect blend of challenge that had me looking at my map to figure out, hmm, which room haven't I been in yet, which room do I need to use to complete this puzzle? I especially loved this area where you had to use the Zonai items provided to raise a mirror to the perfect height to unlock a door. There was a lot of trial and error involved in the solving of this room on my part, but it felt fabulous to do so. All culminating in a fun boss fight against the Queen of the Gibdos. Love the way she shuffles about. Also love the way they discover what an elevator is for the first time. I need more modern day conventions being thrown into Hyrule for the people to interact with, it's hilarious. If all the dungeons had the same quality as the Lightning Temple, we'd have a perfect Zelda game. And that's why it takes my number one spot. Well now I just want to play the old Zelda games and do dungeon and boss rankings for all of them. Would anyone be interested in that? I could consider it after my summer vacation, perhaps. 
Either way, thanks for watching. Be sure to parry that subscribe button for weekly gaming content every Wednesday. I primarily focus on Soulsborne rankings, but I have other games and series I want to dive into and rank when I have more time. My social links are on screen now, feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. A massive shout out to my patrons over on Patreon, you guys keep this channel alive. Thank you so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Adios.